start always from a very short self-presentation, who you are, your personal story probably behind, and then the five minutes trip for the beach, and then right after that we go to Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Paul, I'm Norwegian, and Laura, you do not have a unicorn yet, so I hope that we can actually contribute to that. That's going to be Robin, uh, I really hope so. So, Robin, the name is uh, Batman's best friend and a superpower. Robin also stands for Robot Intelligent in order to handle the customers smoothly with the latest technology. Obviously, I love traveling. I've always loved traveling, both personally and professionally. But I am frustrated that in 2019, traveling is still a hassle. When I came to Singapore last year, I hadn't heard about Grab and I struggled to get around. And still, we see business travelers queuing for taxis. What a waste of time. I've also been fooled by using TripAdvisor, and how am I to know that John from Dublin has my taste? Last year, I went for a wedding in India, and I spent hours just to get a SIM card, talking about being lost in translation. And uh, I've been to the airport and talking to travelers, and they also confirm that there's a hassle with traveling. So challenge accepted. We want to provide a super travel tool. Robin will find the right information to navigate seamlessly in a foreign city. So we will find the best way to your hotel or the restaurant according to your taste. How does it work? So, travelers can use this service for free. And through the Robin platform, we will connect you to local service providers and local content. So through the service providers' APIs, we will help you getting the tickets, the essentials, or ride hailing. So Airbnb, they connect travelers to apartments. Robin connects travelers to local service uh, providers. So we are already available in, uh, um, in uh, Singapore. And, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, and uh, we are available on Facebook Messenger. And uh, we want to, why do we choose messaging platforms? The reason for that is that everybody is already on the messaging platforms. So uh, we want to launch this on WeChat, WhatsApp, and also obviously also the, um, the traditional apps. So what exactly does Robin do? It's all about convenience. It's about that you should do a few clicks, should get your SIM card, or you should, if you need a shedding kit that you got, we'll have it delivered to your hotel room in two hours, or even you can talk to us directly and you can get some local advice. The travel industry, it represents more than 10% of the global GDP, and it's growing fast. 235 million international visitors to 20 cities, and 100 billion US dollar only spent on local services and shopping. The business travelers that are coming to Singapore spend more than 1,200 US dollar, and that's why we will, in the beginning, target business travelers. How do we make money? We make money on commission and affiliate revenue, and at the long run, we also aim to make a white label solution, and we'll also look into subscription solutions. Our goal to market is a B2B, B2C. So in the beginning, we will focus on events and conferences. And the reason for that is that that way we can easily connect to inbound visitors to Singapore. The next step is to team up with public distribution in order to get uh, access to a larger and more international audience. But our ultimate goal is to be a strong brand and being the preferred travel companion for travelers. Timeline, we have already developed an MVP in Messenger. We will start to build our apps and a solution in WeChat and WhatsApp. And language is also a key success factor because we want to tap into the opportunity with the Chinese tourism, which represents more than 100 million visitors yearly. That's why we we'll also translate this service into different languages. We're proud to be selected by four hotels to participate in KivaTech. Now in May, we will meet up with uh, uh, their innovation team, and we have a lot of 
other partners who built up the, the concept by event holders, by service providers, and other operational uh, partners. In order to understand the business, you have to look into the market landscape. So we wanted to take the best out of travel on the market with Concierge to create an awesome travel experience. And we have a team that will be enabled and realize this. So we are both from, from Singapore, Britain, and Norway. And we are vast experience in traveling, digital, uh, and tech. But we need some money to get the wheels in motion. So uh, if there's anyone here, please put up the offer. And with the investment, we will launch in 100 cities, our own tech, and 10,000 users. Five minutes short. Thank you very much. Wow. Okay, so it was just in time, it was like 10 minutes late. Perfect, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions to Paul? And if I can ask you first, I will leave you a mic and also uh, start from your name and a quick introduction. Good evening, guys, please participate. Yeah? Uh, can you please press the mic? Hi, my name is Ted. Um, Speak up. Hi, my name is Ted. Um, your deployment plan or your first proof of concept, are you doing a proof of concept in a location? If you can explain more, um, please. Okay, so what we've done in order to have a proof of concept, we've been doing 150 years with Travis HIV. We've been talking to business Travis on the end year. So uh, right now, uh, to be aligned with the gold market, we focus on uh, the events. So that's why we have an uh, MOU signed with both Echelon and also with uh, Smash. And that, that's where we're going to test it with real customers. The service is available today, so we do have some customers, but uh, we're focusing on, on these upcoming events uh, now and anyway. If I may follow up. So, proof of concept also in terms of revenue model. So, um, is that included? So. Uh, the revenue model, we have a uh, unit economics of approximately $10 per, per, uh, per visit. And we expect that uh, the traveler, business traveler, will visit uh, six times per year. And we have a, a customer acquisition cost of, actually, not the customer acquisition cost now is a bit lower because we will team up with these events, but normally it would be around $25. And we have a lifetime value of uh, 160 uh, years old. Thank you. More questions? Yeah? Hi, my name is Roman. I work with the company called IES. Uh, my question is with the relation to your roadmap, and, and you're, you show a roadmap of starting off from B2B, which I like, because B2B is something that you easy to do and it's easy, easily available to, to scale that model. But going from B to B, B to C, in that kind of a quick, quick roadmap, I think that's going to be really good. B to C is a different beast altogether. And I think you, you're going to see some success on the B to B side, but I think it's going to be really challenging to do B to C. So what, what have you thought? How will you really engage with your C? How will you gamify? How will you make it go viral? What are you thought? It's a very good question, and for me, I've been working on this article before, and, and for me, it's the most important thing is the distribution. And that's why we are focusing on, on B2B, B2C. So that's why we start with the events, and we'll keep the Singapore guy and help their visitors um, journey. But then again, so if a person attending Echelon, he will use the service, and next time he's going on another trip, Bangkok or to Paris, then you would be I, I'm using the services of a private person. But still our focus is B2B to B2C to and then we will try to create DGMS of those who are using it through events. I mean, that's gonna be really hard. I mean I don't see you becoming a unicorn unless you do B2C. Like B2B is is good, but if you want to do something really awesome, you need to do this B2C. That's really hard. It's really hard from, from your model here. I think it's really hard. Perhaps you would look at B to C right away. And maybe it's going to take you five years, but then you're going to get there. Yeah. So, again, um, the thing that makes it a bit challenging is like, uh, 
that we are not in the service of travelers. Who's coming to Singapore now? And we're all available in Singapore, so it's difficult. So that's why we do the events. But, the, uh, but uh, to get back to... I think, I think you're going to get stuck in the events. Yeah. What's going to happen is you're going to see some success or doing the events, you're going to get stuck there. And then, you know, five years later, you're doing the event, that's it. Right, no so there is a bit of time pressure. We don't turn it into uh, the debate. But, you can still but, talk but, about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't finish yet. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the, the way I think about how to reach uh, VTC is through influencers. I think that's, you can, because this is a new service, you have to contextualize it, and using influencers, you are able to, to get it out. And uh, using these new channels that exist today is for me the way to go. Okay, next question was there. Can you discuss one? You mentioned you're going to build a uh, standalone app for, for Robin. Mm -hmm. Does it have a chat function? That will also have a chat function, yes. So, um, it is important to understand that uh, how it is today in Messenger and our uh, web solution. It is almost like a function like an app, you have buttons and click. It's not meant that you should only ask, get me a SIM card or get me a uh, uh, or something. So you have two possibilities. You can use the buttons and the experience is like a normal app, or it's like the chat function. And the app will have the same. I, I call the previous gentleman sentiment because uh, basically the next generation for chat will be WeChat. Right, all the services going through smart chatbots, and the possible uh, cooperation of buy you off will be Google, because it's the only one that doesn't have a uh, long-lasting chat application. So you may want to consider that. And also, I'd like to add, it's like for me, I'm already very passionate about the conversation interface, and what we will see now in the future, what's going to happen with voice, we will change. Uh, the market because we're now uh, like 94, 95 with the internet. This is what we're going to do. That is what we are now for the voice. So, using uh, Siri, using Alexa, using the system and other solutions. So, there's a lot of opportunities, and we will have the learning from this, and this you can uh, use for voice. I was just going to make a couple of comments here. I mean, B2B is actually a good way to make a lot of money. There's only a small part. But the thing that I find intriguing about this is you're, you're kind of like a consolidated real estate, and your model should perhaps be more like that on the B2B stage, where you're bringing together a whole bunch of guys and they're willing to pay for the scene, as, like, in addition to subscribers and people talking about it. Um, it depends on how much, you know, how, how you aggregate the whole people together. Of course. And that's also, I would mean, show the fact that in the presentation here, I mentioned this opportunity with big data and the Python, and then I can also do that with the business model. You have to have the users first before they can tackle that. Hi. Uh, I like that you start by events. Uh, this uh, reminds me of Airbnb. They really managed to move from there, so we show a great success as well. Uh, but since I was thinking about Airbnb, now they moved beyond the accommodation. They provide experience. They they may provide uh, restaurant recommendations as well based on your taste. Uh, where do you have an age compared to where they're going, and how do you how do you manage to compete with them? So I think what makes us different from uh, Airbnb is uh, the, the conversation interface. They don't do on that. Uh, and also, we would uh, try to tap into the on demand, which they're not, because Airbnb is focusing more on the experience side. So that's how I look upon that we are different uh, today. Thank you. And the time is up. Thank you very much Thank for the uh, questions.
Hi, my name is Eric, I'm also Norwegian. Uh, I'm from FinTech company called Eagle, which I'll tell you a little bit more uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, basically, banking is being disrupted. New legislation, new technology, new and players. You use the mic. Sorry. Really. New technology, new legislation, new players are disrupting. More so, new experiences, new expectations from, uh, from the customers. So they're expecting more from the banks. Uh, and key to this is customer simplicity. All the banks talk about customer simplicity, but very few deliver on it. Why? Because they struggle. They have legacy systems, they have the ways that they've always done things, and they really, really don't know. They, they come up with new ideas, but they can't implement them. Uh, so this is where we come in. Uh, we want to help banks solve that problem. So we work with banks instead of against banks. Uh, we partner with banks, we come in, we have uh, solutions uh, that we implement under their brand name, etc. etc. So, we're going to start with the first product that we're launching. Uh, so, how many here uh, pays uh, expenses uh, for their company and get reimbursement? Most of you, right? Anyone run a business and you have people traveling and you have to deal with all of this? How much time do you spend on administration? A lot, right? So here's a big problem. Here's a big problem that we need to fix. And a lot of people are trying to fix this, but they haven't managed to do it. So what we have, um, have developed is a system that fixes this. It's called QBusiness, and it provides simplicity and control for businesses and the employees. It consists of cards. They can be virtual or they can be physical cards. Uh, the black one is a credit card. But the white one is very interesting. It's a prepaid card. So you can load that card. You can put money on it. You can take money away from it. You can give every employee one card with no value on it. But if they're traveling, if they need to spend money, you put money on it. So how do you do that? Well, that's the beauty of it. The center comes to this uh, digital platform that allows people, that allows the uh, business owner or the manager or the finance manager to load cards, to take money from cards, to issue cards, uh, to cancel cards, etc., etc. You can see everything on movements in real time. So you don't have to wait for your credit card statement or your, your card statement. You can see it immediately. Uh, and Roy gets a, an app as well. Uh, on the app, he or she can look at their uh, own, um, own uh, transactions. Um, they can cancel, they can block the cards permanently or, or Temporary, they can request more funds on the card. Uh, so it's a really, really simple system for people to manage. And then they can scan the receipts, and the receipt is connected then to the transaction, to so know the transaction. So when we do that, uh, it's all connected. So all of this works together the Q Control, the Q Business app, and the cards, and that's a, it's, a, it's an integrated system for managing all of this. Obviously, we're connecting with Zero and, and all the, all the uh, systems. So where are we? We've established a design experience front end the center in Singapore. We're building our back end center in Edinburgh. We've set up our HQ and also we signed with all the necessary players. Um, we are launching QBusiness Back, their credit card, on May 10th. We're launching Q Control, the, the center in July. Uh, we're launching the prepaid card state this year and we're getting our e money license in Europe. Uh, we've signed 66 banks in the IP group, we signed another bank. We're in discussion with a number of banks, also in this region. Um, and we're signing with the schemes. Uh, we are currently bootstrapping. Uh, we have some loans and, and tax grants to University of Norway, but we have ongoing revenue implementation fees right now in the future card fees and transaction fees, and we get some uh, schemes support. We have five more products and services in the pipeline. Uh, we're not focusing on that now. What are we looking for? We're not really looking to fund at the moment, uh, but if someone wants to talk to us, we may look for the future. What we are looking for are banks. Banks are interested in implementing a really, really easy, simple system, and we can build it immediately. We have a very, very strong uh, co-founder team, uh, all of them except me. I've never worked in a bank. Uh, everyone else comes from banking, Visa, MasterCard, and all of us. I come from digital, I come from, uh, from the experience side. And that was my presentation.
say Nori uh, being on time, nine seconds left. Well done, thank you. So Q&A. Okay. <laughs> you, you know you're going to teach later, right? So then we'll take your time. Actually, I'm very interested in this area because I'm uh, also a startup guy and I, would, I want to minimize my admin. Yeah. And uh, we're also trying to use these guys like uh, TransferWise, yeah. Revolut. Yeah. I think they're really uh, innovating because they're getting all these transaction charges. Yeah. How are you getting involved in that scene? Because that's going to be a challenge for you. So, so when we started this, and, and this is literally a year ago, uh, almost over to this day, that we started this company, we sat, we talked about Revolut. Because obviously Revolut is down at one point in the world at the moment. Uh, what Revolut has is that they have really great ideas, but they don't have many customers. Uh, they have 250,000 active customers, which is nothing in this market. Uh, what we, the reason why we chose them to go with the banks and to partner with the banks was that we can provide uh, cloud-based services to the banks whilst they can maintain their traditional uh, uh, setups. Uh, so, so we're obviously having to integrate a lot with the APIs and, and stuff like that. So, uh, so that's how we do it. Sorry to be a challenger, but Revolut wants to um, basically stop you from using the banks. Yeah, we know that. We know that. So, so, but the banks have a, a, an advantage. They have a lot of customers and they have a, a market presence. And for us, we use the banks as the partnering with the banks allows us to use them as a marketing and a sales channel, and they it allows them to use us. And especially, we work with a lot of small and mid-sized banks. They don't have innovation departments. They don't have resources. They can barely issue a credit card because it's, it's too difficult. For them. So we help them to do that. Uh, and we, we pick other providers so we can, we can provide credit from, from one bank to a third party bank. But yeah, of course. Revolut is, uh, and TransferWise is doing great. TransferWise has changed a lot. And, 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 yeah. So Michael here, uh, also in the region. Uh, I just wondered, you have five new products. Yeah. So what kind of progress is that? Is that building on the ecosystem or the network you're creating? Yeah, so some of it is, well, some of it is, um, I don't want to build in too much detail on our future products. This is typical um, no Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if you present it here, if you were a local company, you would disclose everything. But no, uh, it's up to you. Well, this yes, yes, important thing for us is that we really want to focus on our, our current into the uh, proposition simply because we're getting a lot of traction. I was at uh, a um, major international bank today presenting, and all they could say, I get it, I get it, I get it. Uh, how do you run this into a pilot? And that was the first meeting on a major bank. So, so we're kind of seeing that this is running. We have, have signed all these banks, we have revenue. Um, we're, really, we're really running for that. Uh, but we want to make sure that everything we build is built for the future. So we're modularizing everything, microservices, we're connecting everything so that in the future we can take our um, pay on, on, on beta and apply to other sectors. May not be B2B, could be B2C, could be in a more of a credit space, providing, providing loans, etc. So those are the things that we're, we're looking into and we're trying to see how we can utilize the technology that we're developing. In the future, we're, we're putting a lot of machine learning and AI onto this. Right now, it's very basic. But in the future, a lot of the analytics that we're building on top of this will, will utilize that. Are you raising funds? We're not raising funds at the moment, um, simply because we haven't uh, had to. Uh, we may have to in the future. Uh, but right now, we're, we're comfortable. So we're, we're kind of just the Thanks. Yeah. Uh, it's Michael. Uh, I'm sorry for Werner's presentation. The question is coming from Compa Digital. Okay. Um, I'm a little bit confused with the business model, to be honest, because you have a uh, financial institution license, or you're applying for yeah. At the same time, you want to work with the banks. Yeah. And at the same time, you want to work with the banks in Asia. Yeah, so we've not, we've not applied for any licenses in Asia at the moment. We're applying for a European money license. 
Uh, we don't technically need a license for everything we do. But we need a, a license for uh, when we issue prepaid cards. We need, if we want to issue those, uh, those cards in our own name, which we, we do, um, we will have to have a license. So it's, we're not, we're not going to be a, a bank. That's not our, our goal. I don't think I can get a competitor to the bank, to the banks, which you are trying to sell products. Yes, and the first, yes, and no. Yeah. yeah, we're not, we, we've made a strategic decision not to do that. So our, our business model is based on partnering with banks, uh, delivering the services, banking as a service or banking as a platform to them, and not actually uh, competing uh, directly with them. I mean, we'll compete with, uh, with our, our partner banks' competitors, for sure. But, but uh, we're not setting up a bank, we're not, we're not funded to be to the bank, to be <laughs> completely honest, that's, that's a completely different thing. Uh, I understand yeah. your, your own proposition because really lots of banks are, are lacking the, uh, yeah. the service that we are providing. That's where we are coming from. Okay. But uh, uh, what I do understand, if you issue the cards using the banks, then you have competitive pricing, so you're not so competitive. So, uh, especially for some of these small banks, they, can't, they, can, they can issue uh, debit cards, they can issue um, uh, credit cards to, in the, uh, in the uh, personal uh, space, personal banking space. They cannot issue, they don't have the capacity to issue credit cards in the business space. So then we need, we use a third party bank that issues that credit. We don't issue that credit. But we, we will probably issue uh, charge cards in the future, which we can do on a new money license in Europe. Here it's different, there will be different licenses in different countries. But that's the question about your pricing, yeah, because yeah. If you are, because I guess that we are not the principal member of MasterCard or yeah. Visa, so we cannot issue the cards under your own. Well, we, 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 yes. we will be a principal member. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? We still have time. Not this time, sorry. I don't know actually, because some of the people might be not aware, but like when we were doing the rehearsal for this speech, um, the thing which uh, the company is trying to solve with the product is very, very relevant because there are a lot of big companies here who don't want to finance, pre-finance your business trips. And I heard personally, I'm not going to mention the names here, but it's quite a big company, it's just their standard rule. They pay everybody with 30 days delay, so their employees saying, Sorry, we cannot continue doing the business plan, um, like development to go on the trips to Indonesia and everywhere because I have to pay with my own credit card and then you will pay to me after I will return this to you and then 30 days pass. So, sorry, I'm not going to do any more business trips. So this is a very relevant solution. It doesn't, it doesn't compete with the banks because they don't want to order their credit cards for their employees. We, we've talked to a lot of companies and, and especially companies that have young employees they can't. They come to to check in at the hotel. They don't have money on their card, so they don't have enough credit. Uh, it's a it's a big problem. So 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 to solve that for them is really important. We, the bank that I met this uh, this morning, I said, because we're positioning it for for SMBs primarily, but we're getting a lot of people saying. So the guy said, could we implement this in our bank for our employees? Because this sounds like something that we could we could use. So um, so so a lot of uh, bigger companies are are seeing this. Um, so you're right, there, there are opportunities. There is like a certain niche because you don't compete with the big banks, you do it for um, online banks, retail banks, right? Online no, banks, sorry. No, not mostly online banks, mostly uh, old school, um, old school brick and mortar banks. Mm -hmm. Obviously they have uh, online platforms as well, but they, they are the, the, the incumbent. These are banks that have been running since 1850. And they, they, they don't know how to innovate. They don't understand how can how can they build new products. So that's why they have this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Thank Jerry. You so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So who wants to be the next? We have Alexi and we have Ted. Alexi. First mom, first start. <laughs> 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 Actually, we'll start from self introduction. Yeah, I'll use all the time I can. So, <laughs> nice to see you all here today. Uh, my name is Alexi. I'm coming from uh, Finland and uh, I've been living last uh, three years in Asia. 
Um, I basically grew up in a really entrepreneurial family, uh, quite a big boss entrepreneur. So uh, everything in my life I always learned to earn myself, and uh, I really liked this uh, entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, when I was 18, I started my first business in uh, 3D modeling and uh, perfect pictures for buildings, and uh, also marketing pictures. After uh, that, I did my um, uh, Navy, uh, sort of the exciting time of leadership, and also on the work. And then I got really interested on the on sales. I was running uh, as a head of sales in a uh, food uh, industry startup. Uh, managed to double the customer base in sort of six months, and uh, it was an exciting time. But uh, through my life, I've been always really passionate and uh, excited about technology. So that's what uh, brought me actually to Asia when I started to study uh, what's going on uh, the, the, the technology companies. I started to consult few companies. Uh, I settled in, in uh, Asia and, uh, for the last few years and uh, co-founded uh, Rainbow Tech Solutions um, a little bit over one year ago. And uh, that obviously brings me here today. So, uh, are we settled? Yes, we're on just in So um, I would like to introduce you to Regular Tech Solutions. We are IoT control for ACES with proven 30% savings regardless of brand, age, or model of your uh, AC units. And uh, we are actually solving a huge problem in the world. And its demand for air conditioners is expected triple by 2050 equal to China's electricity demand today. And like you see here, electricity consumption by ACES accounts 43 to 66 percent in buildings. And imagine if you could take away 30% of that. So that's what Rainbow can do. This is our target market in commercial sector with split by basis, three plus basis per room. Globally, we estimated it to be $48 billion the electricity consumed by ACs, from which we can save $16 billion annually. We are based in Thailand where all our research and development has been done, and our market potential market is around 85 million we can save there. While Singapore opens us the rest of the Southeast Asia with a potential of 5.4 million dollar savings. So this is our solution. Like you see, this is from the convenience store. We have done over 50 sites with the similar results, 33% savings by optimization only. These shops consume around $700 every month to keep you comfortable when you go shopping. And we can take away $200 from that. Isn't that great? So how is that possible? Before rain closed, all the machines are working individually and they can't talk to each other. We help them by letting them talk to each other through our clouds. So our cloud actually takes over the control, optimizes the running, and that's how we save so much energy. We have a lot of great customers, testimonials. We provide additional value over the energy saving by solving the real-time savings from the dashboard, providing the system monitoring with predictive maintenance, and maintaining better inside climate by also providing alarm services. That is especially great for mission critical places like server rooms. And you can become Rainbow Smart in two steps. Pay the one time setup fee and sign up the contract with us. So we will do the installation and you just need to enjoy a step number two, which is use and enjoy our solution. And we have core principles that are to serve our business development. We provide the hardware for free against one year contract and we make the decision really easy with 100% satisfaction guarantee for one year. And all we ask is 50% of the savings we are seeing. And that's how we make money. So these are some of the great customers we have. They have two things at least in common. They are saving energy 
plus they are providing more comfortable environment for their customers and employees. We know our competitors because we have studied them. Till today we haven't identified any competitor that comes even close to say it's a function we are able to provide. Example diving is providing for speed ACs, uh, controlling and energy saving, but that's only for their model, while we work with any brand regardless of age or model. Uh, Echo Saver is providing uh, quite a good savings, but they are not IoT, they are not optimizing multiple machines. So we haven't identified anything that comes close. We have done our research and development from starting mid 2016 to 2018. We have received fundraising of USD 1.8 million. And this year we started to go for paying customers. February we had three, March we hitting six paying customers, and now we are on the way to hit 11 paying customers. We want the record of revenue of $1,000, and we are looking for fundraising of 600000 to bolster our market expansion. And this is how our annual revenue looks. So you see that total annual revenue is accounting our and the distributor's revenue. So we have a distributor business model, which allows us to scale really fast. From 2020 onwards, onwards we start to have already profit for our distributors also, and it's what helps us to scale really fast. In 2021, for rainbow tech solutions alone, we expect to have 7.9 million annual recurring revenue from which we can make profit 4.7 million. And we expect to be totally cash flow positive by the end of 2019 in December. We had sales pipeline of over $1.5 million already. These are the large uh, ongoing processes with bigger customers, global logistic company, uh, convenience store say, and national hospital group. These are all in Thailand. With this one, we actually have already over six of the restaurants under control, and they are really happy of our solution. And we are seeking for growth capital of 600,000 to close to the market expansion. If anyone of here is interested, contribute for a better future, more sustainable future, and at the same time, have a good business to make money, please come to me. And we have a team with combined experience over 190 years in business and technology development from which specifically over 50 years in Asia. And um, thank you very much. And my chairman, please come to talk Just if you have anything done. Thank you. Exact solution, there are a lot of players. Right? Yeah, 
And they're not claiming that others cannot achieve it. Uh, as of today, we understand our position that we need to move fast. So the time is our biggest competitor. Yeah. Uh, first of all, very nice presentation. I really like your business idea. Uh, because it's only like when we set up it. Yeah. I'm not from the business. Which <laughs> 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 I understand that. Uh, so this was a positive for me. Uh, what I would like to focus is the, the, the prior page where you have financial uh, results. Yeah? So you said that the company started in 2016 or something like that. So that yeah. was missing. Yeah? So everybody can put whatever it will be in 2023. He's not from the industry, but he's CEO for banker and all that. Yeah. I know, that's why the question. I did that before. I know. I know. <laughs> so 2016, 2018 was our research and uh, development phase. So at that time, we were not uh, focusing on, on creating the product. We were just focusing to getting the product on the stage where we are confident to, to start to charge customers. Okay. Just going back to the financial world, uh, we were doing English about 2020 plan, and the, the entire management was changed three times in the meantime. So you can have the plan for the next years, but I, I, uh, otherwise, if you're looking for six hundred, you can say what, what was the share that you're giving. So, so what's the percentage? Uh, 10%. And I just want to remind audience that we not only give the feedback on the business model or the business details, but also on the way how it was presented, if it was clear. And I can say from my side that again, we did a few reversals with the vaccine. And the initial deck was really heavy on details because it's a technical solution and there was a sideways installation process and I was lost, I'm not technical. I know it's only five minutes and all people will read everything you put there on the slide, so I tried to make it as clean and lean as possible. And the deck worked well, but you knew that you had five minutes. You managed to present it in time, but it was too quick. I don't know if you felt it, it was a bit difficult to follow all the details. It was just like really, really quick. So such comments are also welcome. The only question I would have is that over time they see and stuff that doesn't matter. Like I mean, what, once you've locked in the savings, you've locked them in. Um, and, and the degradation of the equipment over the passage of time is going to be what you do. So to me, there seems to be a law of diminishing returns here. Um, yeah. How do you compensate for that? You know, given that you're only asking for 600K, it's not a nice law. Well, um, how we have structured this uh, fundraising round is that we have looked at the minimum we need for uh, turning the company has to budget it. And uh, we are looking to do additional fundraising after that. But uh, as a current state, um, we feel more comfortable asking for bigger funding after we are cash flow positive. And it also affects on the state we need to give out from the company. So. I, I guess the question is how long the 600K last you? And whether in fact you should ask for more just to make sure you can keep going. Uh, it's 600,000, you can run for a uh, 10 months call up. Hi, I'm John. And I just want to, uh, I guess, focus on what the barriers brought up. You mentioned you want to share 50 in terms of cost savings. So, at the minimum contract term is one year. Yeah. So, what happened to the cost savings? So uh, what our business really is that uh, our clients uh, are making money, so it's a win-win situation. So that's why we, we don't really uh, feel like we need to find the customers for more than one year. Uh, one year is for us to, to uh, prove for the customers that we are a great service, to make sure that we get happy customers. But uh, at the same time, also with the one year time, we get already uh, our product price back. So uh, we sort of lowered our risk of, of uh, giving the product for free. But initial contract uh, one plus years. So I guess my point is, uh, what would be the benchmark for the cost savings in the second year? Um, our bench benchmark for uh, uh, getting the, our investment back to the, for the investment the customer uh, is six months. After six months, the customer starts to generate actually profit for us already. So, the, so let's uh, be more quantitative. Let's say first year expenditure is 100K, and you manage to save uh, 20,000, so you split. 50-50, So the next year's benchmark would that be 80K? Because that is the point very far about the commission return. A little bit concerning. Uh, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you mean the, the scaling? Yeah, for that for sure we need money. But uh, no, no, not the scaling. I'm talking about the revenue. Yeah. So let's say next year you can use the benchmark of 80k, right? I don't expect you to be able to generate the same amount percentage-wise in terms of cost savings. So it's unlikely you can generate another twenty thousand dollars cost savings in the second year. Uh, so so you sure. keep on reducing. So therefore, your fifty percent share. So, so how we calculate the difference from saving that we, we charge mm -hmm. is we do the synchronizing. So so it's, it's always based on how much your system consumes without our solution and without our solution. So every year our recurring revenue from, from one customer will be the same. So are you saying you always benchmark on the first to uh, expenditure in the first year? Yeah, expenditure without our solution. That's where we benchmark. So uh, anytime the customer uh, uh, start feeling that it's okay, they can synchronize the system. And, and what it really means that our machine speaks for the measure mode, where it's measuring just what happens in your, your space, and giving you how much the space is consuming uh, electricity. And uh, after that, you can switch back on the control mode, and then you get a new benchmark on, on where you need to uh, look how much uh, charge. Do you have any uh, trial customers that have already gone through at least one iteration that is into the second year of the contract? Uh, not, not so far. Right. So we just starting off with many customers. I guess from a legal standpoint, because I'm lawyer in practice, so, um, I think it would be a bit hard to enforce you know, a like one year contract and say, oh, by the way, next year we're still going to face on last year's uh, you know, expenditure for cost savings and so uh, What it really means that is they still own the hardware. So if the customer is not uh, happy and they think that the contract is over, uh, it's fine, we just sub the service. And, and, and then they have the same cost that they had before. It, it, it's really being made. Uh, we are making money and the customer is making money. So uh, I don't feel that we're gonna have an issue with uh, customers feeling that we overshot them because uh, they are getting the service for free. And uh, basically, I think, I think you have to bear in mind the comment from um, you know, the other If you are you know, having a monopoly, sure, you know, I think that would work. But even then, I would suggest you want to couch it in a way that would be sounding more reasonable to the uh, you know, audience or to the uh, consumer. Uh, I would say that regarding the how much it charges customers, that we maybe need to adjust according to uh, how the community landscape uh, develops. Uh, now it is starting, we want to take the advantage of, of being uh, the first mover of that space. So uh, for sure, when we get uh, or the situation where we're stop it, so people will come on this space. Yeah, it's like uh, either using your solution or going back to the normal or using somebody else's solution, which is fine because it's not the market. So if somebody's solution is better by the time, okay. But yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Alexi. <laughs> that was my hard QA. <laughs> Yes, we have to press the button. I'm so sorry for that. No worries. So here, 
I need your help. So pretend today that you own a, a big building, right? And you want to accelerate the green economy as in maybe having some charging Can you please points. speak up? I can hear you at the back. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so pretend you're a property owner, you own Ion or some other big shopping center or something, and you want to be a maybe a green citizen and have some charging points, some electric vehicle charging points. So this is the concept I want to pitch to you and see if you're convinced. So that's what I'm looking for today. So, hello, um, my name is Ted from Plugit and we are Charging Solutions Leadership. Uh, we do charging as a service. We make it simple for you, so we do the hardware, software, service. We have reliable hardware, we have scalable solutions, we use open platforms, so we have different hardware from different manufacturers, so you're never locked into one manufacturer. We can work with your renewable if you have some solar panels. We have storage to have battery storage if you need it. And we can even do wireless charging, though it's not really ready yet. Our business model for you is to be a, a white label. So we can brand you, so if it's ION, it'll be an ION app, ION cloud, as in the mall. Or you don't have to have a brand, you can be non-branded as well. So I've got four questions for you. What's your EV demand? So if you're a car park and it's just starting as it is in Singapore, so you're probably looking for plug-in hybrid and some AC charging equipment. If, it's, if you're a taxi operator, you might need something faster like DC. Number two question, do you want to be branded or not? Do you want to have your brand out there or are you okay to have a vanilla? Number three, do you want to operate your charging stations or do you want to outsource? If your core business is shopping mall, maybe you don't want to operate, you want to leave it to someone else. And number four, do you want to collect revenue? Do you want to give it for free? If you're a shopping mall, a lot of people are not shopping anymore, they're going online. But if you give it for free, they'll come for the free, free, free charging for sure. So do you want to provide payment or not? So first, <coughs> identify your demand. So we've already identified a few use cases. First of all, we have big electricity companies who want to dominate, like Singapore Power. Then we have fleet, which is like taxi companies, but they want fast charging because it's critical to their business. Then we have OEMs. OEMs are the car manufacturers like Nissan, BYD, uh, for example. Then car park. If you're a shopping mall, this is your segment. Are you the operator? Are you outsourcing to someone? What kind of cars come into your mall? Are you a high end, a medium, low end? Maritime. Maritime is also a segment for ports. And insurance companies are coming in now because they are finding that OEMs, the car manufacturers, are selling. Um, insurance with their car, and they're locking out the traditional insurance companies that are building their own networks. Sorry, I haven't got the time to go. Anyway, so what we found in uh, Finland is that the, the demand grew very quickly. Once there was a few operators in the market, that created the chicken egg solution that people had confidence that cars came very quickly. Fortunately, we uh, used our concept and we got 80% of the market. This is our platform. In Singapore, what we have is a scenario of ghost charges. What does that mean? The green mark, which is a certification for green, you can check it, check it off if you just char put in a charger. Uh, however, no one ever uses it, so it's like, like a white elephant. But we want to match it to demand, and that's the whole point here. In Singapore, we've got about 20% market share with a local operator using their brand. Now, are you branded or not? What's the difference? If it's our brand, it's free. Now that sounds quite good. If it's branded, you have to pay a little bit more for the branding on the app, but it's quite low cost. In this case, if you press public charging point, everybody is interoperable. You're on the same map. So immediately, you have a bigger network. And then you've got the map view, you've got the uh, list view, and if you click on one, you can see what's available straight away, even navigation. Then operate or not. Of course you want to see the operational efficiency of your charging network, so we provide that. But you really want to manage all your charges? You want to see all the alerts, go there, repair it? We have a solution outsourced for you for 100 bucks per month. Payment. So we have a contactless payment solution. 
So who uses grab? Probably everybody. Same. We have the credit card behind. You navigate, you start charging, stop charging, you've got live information on your charging, and then you get your receipt all linked through your car, car so it's easy as possible. Then what we also provide is the whole journey data. So this is a particular user. If you're, for example, a taxi owner, you want to make sure, or a top taxi operator, you want to see how your drivers have been doing, how much cost. So we provide all of that. If you're an insurance company, we'll also provide how good this driver has been at charging his car. So it's very important to have this journey data by driver. So, Singapore case. So what do we do? White label, meaning our brand is not here. We did the charge of branding for them, we did the lot, we did the app, the RFID tags, and we also helped them install. So the whole solution for them. So what are we looking for today? We're looking at proof of concept players, so advocates, if you're in the green energy tech area, please come to us. We want to accelerate this whole movement. We are, we are out of time. Sorry, five right. minutes. So that's all it. Car park operating building and also install us. That's what we're looking for. Thank you very much. You can still address it during the Q&A. Thank you, Dan. So questions, comments, and in this case, we didn't have a chance to do rehearsal or talk about the deck and everything. But Ted is quite an experienced presenter. Yes. What about the money? What about the money? What about that? I heard a hundred dollars for for the branding of the app, but it's not your revenue, right? No, oh, no, no. So we do software as a service, charging as a service. So uh, if you're all familiar with the concept of as, of as a service, it takes away the capex of you know building this whole software ecosystem. Just pay a small fee per month. We have uh, quite a few customers, so we're already say, profit making. So now we operate very low fee, and all you do, all we are kind of paying for is the cloud, you know, the data transmission, um, and that's it. And then if it's a free app, you don't have to pay for any branding. If it's a branded app, you have to pay for the development of that. So that's about it. So we're all sort of, sort of all about uh, dispersing as much as possible. Hey, uh, what's your appetite for the POC? How much are you ready to put in cash? Who said I was going to put in cash? Well, <laughs> if, you, if you want to do something with the government, for example, no, you have to put in cash. No, no, you see, uh, my concept here is such that uh, we want the building owner uh, to, um, you could say, enjoy the lowest cost hardware, lowest cost software, but there are some costs there. Um, in terms of proof of concept, that would be, yeah, you're right. If we're doing one only, maybe we'll fund the hardware and the software. But we're also looking for operators to come in with the lowest cost in the market to, to do this. So that's how I, I mean, this is where I'm trying to learn today, uh, to get the pitch right. Have you already started doing something here, or have you recently started here? What's, what's your history, and what, what are you planning to do? So we've already signed a deal for half a mil here, but, but Red Rock Power is going out of business. But no, they, no, no, they're pivoting, that's the point. So <laughs> Red Dot Power is rebranded into something new which hasn't been announced yet, and they're going to do integrated services, so it's all committed. Okay. We're giving out all the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's getting these. Yeah, sorry. Uh, just one comment and a question. Uh, I like the way you started, because you asked the audience to help you out. And to imagine ourselves as uh, couple operators. Uh, I'm Singaporean, I'm not very good with imagination, so <laughs> it was a struggle. Uh, here's my question. Uh, Singapore's uh, power generation that is not petroleum based is 50,000 uh, gigawatts. So that is total power generation. And the percentage that is not petroleum based is 1.6%. In other words, uh, if we go electrical vehicle, uh, we are actually penalizing ourselves in terms of petrochemical um, G, uh, share of the GDP. Now, my question, therefore, is that looking outside of Singapore, have you identified nearby countries where the percentage of uh, non petrochemical power generation is higher, and therefore the adoption of uh, EVs uh, for the next five to ten years is more likely? Yeah, I mean, 
mean, um, that's a, quite a challenging question, but uh, uh, let me get your point first, if you don't mind. So, uh, you're saying non-petrol generated power, is that right? And you're saying we're penalizing because most of it is petrol oil generated. Um, for example, you, you must be aware that Elon Musk had just criticized the government last year for slapping 15,000 tax um, on electric vehicles. So there are at least uh, four other countries all over the, uh, all over the world, like the BRICS countries, where, uh, for example, Brazil is 80% electrical generation without using petroleum based. And uh, right now, I mean, they're going through some EV. Um, legislation challenges, but if it takes off, it's going to be really fast. So you were saying that they, that you want to promote renewable energy, is it? Is well, I, I think uh, in Singapore, I think Singapore is going to be hard uh, to promote uh, electric vehicles and to make it economically sustainable for a citizen to own one. So maybe it's just fee based or uh, government sponsored. Okay, actually, uh, the, the reason electric vehicles are expensive today is the battery. Um, otherwise, everything else is like 50% cheaper than the internal combustion engine. So when the battery prices come down, which they will because of uh, volume, then they'll be cheaper than the internal combustion engine. Number two, operating costs are 80% cheaper. What do I mean by that? Charging your car is 80% cheaper than buying. So if you spell $1,000 on petrol every month, now you only spend 200 for the same distance. And maintenance is also 80% cheaper. There's only 12 moving parts almost in a whole electric car compared to an internal combustion engine. So actually, um, to promote it, one thing Nordics, why, and Sammy didn't answer the question, why Nordics are leading? Because of high taxation. Uh, the taxation you pay as a, as a citizen through income tax goes into subsidies into rebates into the cars which promoting the industry. It's not happening here, as we all know the tax levels are a little bit lower. But actually the electric car, that extra that extra cost that we have today should be subsidized to promote it. But the government's not doing that. They have a twenty thousand rebate at the moment for zero emission today. My my just last remark, I don't want to prolong this. Um, Norway is generating electricity from hydropower, wind turbines, and geothermal. Singapore is generating electricity from petroleum. And the petroleum comes from our refining industry, which also generates the plastics industry and all other chemicals, which actually drives our GDP. So what are you going to do with the petroleum we're not going to burn on the roads if we all switch to EV? We can talk about that one time. So in terms of numbers, in terms of numbers, I think you, and I got this from a, another conference, the nine billion that Singapore gets in, in terms of, I think, uh, whether it was, I think it was revenue, obviously whatever tax they make, but only half a billion is actually what they sell on the road. The rest of it is refined and sold over. So yeah, it's a half a billion you're going to lose, but there are ways to make different types of money. I'm sure taxation is always a favorite. Uh, so there are ways. I think the, they're not rocking the boat with oil and gas. Shell just bought our competitor, Green Lots, which is Singaporean. So they wait for the oil and gas companies to go in. They don't want to rock the boat, like you said, but they could. So in a way, it could be greener if it wasn't for the tax revenue. Thank you, Mike. <coughs> yeah, just, I'm not sure if it's a silly question, but presumably all your CPOs that you're offering this are a really cheap SaaS product they're going to make lots of money because of it. So, so they're getting something relatively good value to make even more value. And you've identified that, whether you're a mall or a car park operator or whatever? Well, um, why we're doing it right now is offer. Obviously, uh, we will increase the SaaS because obviously not, uh, they're making so much money. But right now, we want to kickstart the whole uh, chicken egg scenario. So that's why we're offering at this. At some point in the future, as costs increase, we will have to increase as well. No, I get that, but my point is that the reason I want to give you a product and stuff because it is a viable business opportunity, regardless of you know, whether you make 100% or you're chopping down to 50, it's still attractive. Yeah, I mean, the actual um, return based on uh, CapEx from the hardware is within a few years. Once you pay that, a lot of this hardware is quite reliable. It lasts for five plus years. So once you've made money after two years, then you're, you know, 
the only the electric the electricity costs and the power costs that you have. So yes, it should be a good business. But then the main point here is that EVs are not here yet. You know, if there's no demand, you can't really make that money. But we have to, it's a chicken and egg. Unless you have one side, the other side hasn't got confidence. So we have to lay the groundwork and we try to make it as cost efficient as possible. Sure, I, I was talking more on the mature, I mean, they allow us to understand. Yeah, hi, uh, hi, Molly. Just a question. Um, just wondering whether there are those car manufacturers who are going into electric vehicles. So, would you consider this as a use case for your company? Absolutely. I mean, uh, so uh, I, uh, sorry for jumping back, but uh, we have these kind of use cases here. So, OEM is the car manufacturers. I see. Okay, and um, you also talk about charging their uh, electric vehicles at home yeah. at their residential places. So, um, would that be another use case? Absolutely. I mean, we call car park in general property. Uh, that's public, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, okay, so Singapore's got a very interesting landscape of HDB. So, it's uh, controlled by the government. So, we, we've uh, had a chapter there. But uh, it's a bit more tricky to get in there. Also, the car parks have only been uh, integrated with energy just to enough for the lighting system. <laughs> and these are high power chargers, so you need to then have to add some more transformers and any supply into there, which is a big cost. So it's not so easy. Uh, Pongol is going to be a little bit of a um, uh, new way of looking at the car parks, but uh, the rest of the landscape is very tricky to set up the supply. The rest of the condos, then you have another tricky of uh, like a condominium. You have to go to the AGM, AGM every year to say, look, we're going to set up a charge, which is once a year, you get, have to get everybody to agree. So it's again, not so easy. <laughs> so that's why we want to go to private building owners first, where it's easiest to get the uh, decisions made. So yeah, we have tried other use cases. Okay, we have the last question because we're running out of time. First of all, it's always good to have Polish partners. Um, but to be honest, why I'm saying about that, because uh, I completely agree with the point that there is no reason to have electric cars in Singapore. However, I like your business model. Yeah? And, and I'll tell you why. Uh, because in Poland, the electricity is coming from the coal. So if you are having the electric car, by default, you are less eco-friendly than a uh, petrol car. The same in Singapore. But there will be always market for electric cars because it's trendy and people want to use it so they have to charge it somewhere. And your business model with the shopping malls that you offer like free charging, etc. to attract these electric vehicles, I really like it. Does it make sense to have electric cars in Singapore? No. Will they be here? Yes. Is there a business model for you? Yes. Is it a big scale? No. <laughs> <laughs> I like to disagree there, but um, the point being is um, you're still saving CO2 emissions last mile in the car. So you can't deny what you're saying, what, you're, what the gentleman arguing is that well, you burn more coal, which also generate more CO2 on the front end of the street. However, it is over a period of five years already made a net return in less CO2. So it is worth it uh, in the longer term. Maybe the first few years you're balancing about the amount of generation from the coal. However, you must look at the governments have to start changing from this fossil fuel generation to renewable generation. And this is taking off all over the world. Germany, our part, our country next door, is almost like 50% renewables. And they're just next door. So why can't Poland do it? Well, anyway. So what I'm saying is and Singapore could also do the same. They have a lot of sunshine out here. Uh, so and they have floating um, PV farms, floating PV farms in big lakes on the, on the west side. So they can also do it. So it's all about political mindset from top down, I believe. I disagree. And it's political mindset. According to Polish president, we have coal for the next 200 years. <laughs> 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 they just had COPA, which is one of the biggest, uh, you could say, environmentally friendly um, uh, movements in the world, in Katowice, yes. which is the biggest coal mining place in Poland. But they still didn't ship all the policies. Okay. okay. Now, uh, it's a long conversation. You can continue later on. Sorry for that. Uh, Ted, thank you very much. Really well done. Thanks a lot. Thank you for this. Uh,
And the last part, which probably is kind of for not aware about, is that I will ask you in the order how you presented to share what was the value you get out of this exercise. So we'll start from Paul. So obviously, um, the benefit from uh, presenting here is uh, the questions, and uh, I feel like you get with the questions. Uh, that's uh, probably the favorite thing I get out of this. Uh, see how you perceive the idea and what you think is going to be challenging, because uh, at the end of the day, that's what we need to focus on in order to improve our uh, concept and idea. So I really appreciate uh, the questions. Thank you. Well, for me, I'm, I'm very happy that I was able to say anything in five minutes. Because <laughs> <laughs> usually I take a little bit more. Uh, but um, this was a great opportunity. It's the first time I've, I've presented the concept uh, in public. Uh, mostly we have our meetings. So it was a great opportunity to, to do that. Um, a challenge to myself. Uh, so I really like that. I appreciate all the questions and the comments. Um, and uh, yeah, really good experience. Thanks. Great. And as you can see, Eric is not a like young startup or everything. That's why we're saying. I really appreciate that comment. <laughs> <laughs> Ageism. Ageism. That's what that is. No, we're over, but you all work in the marketing space, right? So that's, that's your like full-time job. I'm in advertising for 25 years, and I had the same experience as, as uh, Sam was talking about. You wake up one day and you go, what the hell am I doing in my life? Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, who's next? Where is Alexi? Oh. <laughs> OK. So uh, thank you, Julia and uh, Sami, for ranking it. This uh, was a really nice. And thanks for the audience, for everybody. It was really good feedback and uh, nice to be presenting here today. Uh, it may look uh, easy, I don't know. But uh, it was really a uh, uh, good preparation for Juliet on the uh, pitch deck, and uh, that was obviously helping in uh, getting the message in the shorter time. I also thought that when I start to present, if I do the presentation totally myself, I like to put everything, so it would have like to take three hours in this, instead of five minutes. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so thank you for all the feedback and uh, comments. Thank you. Ted? Come over to the stage, don't be shy. <laughs> I'm very shy. I'm also a little bit older, so before you say it, do it. Yeah, I mean, some really good questions, really tough concepts, I really appreciate. Because there's a lot of misgivings and misunderstandings in this industry, I'm not saying it's a little bit, but, but how that we have to move and start the movement. You know, it's, uh, it's a bit challenging. So even though we're doing a solution, but there's a lot of background that people need to learn. And sometimes we have to educate more and do less of our business just to get people to realize it is a good thing, even in no matter which market. So it's a, it's a tough one, that, especially in five minutes. So I appreciate the tough questions. Yeah. yeah, but when you have to educate people about the specifics of your business, it means that you're doing something really new or new to the region. So. Okay, thanks everybody for your participation and support and very active questions and struggles sometimes with their business model, what you think is going to work, what's not going to work. Thank you very much and I'm looking forward to see you next time. Thanks. Thank you, Sonia.